Hi, everybody. Hope that you're doing well, um, that you've been having a good week. Today, I'm going to finish talking about T-cell development um, and then move into trafficking um, as I remain to be behind, but I'll figure my I'll figure something out. Um, remember that you have the T cell development problem set due on Monday at five, um, and the PRR assignment due on Friday, um, and both of those are posted on Moodle. So we left off um, last time, kind of talking through the steps of T cell development that were uh, that are shown here um, in the thymus. So our cells will enter into the thymus um, kind of, this is showing it in the medulla. I usually think about it as a little closer to the edge between the two. It doesn't really matter right now. Um, and those cells will be really coming in as double negative cells. They're going to um, rearrange their um, beta genes this is just talking about the alpha beta cells. Um, we talked last time about the fact that, in fact, gamma and delta are going to be rearranging as well, um, but I'm not focusing on that here. Um, we're going to sort of have a checkpoint to see if we have a good heavy chain. Um, the cells are going to, so this would be kind of DN1 and DN2 over here. Then the cell will be a DN3 uh, pre-T cell. Um, we'll see some proliferation. That cell will be rearranging alpha, um, and we're going to kind of make sure that we have a functional light chain protein, and then we get to our mature double positive cell. And you can see many of these steps were happening in the cortex, and our cell is now sort of moving towards the medulla. Um, and we left off last time talking about um, some of the details regarding central tolerance in T cells. Um, so with central tolerance, um, of course, we are dealing with self-reactivity and trying to make sure that we don't release um, harmful self-reactive cells into the periphery. Though, as you will see um, today, um, just like we saw with central tolerance in B cells, um, there are some things that you can look at and be like, ooh, there's a little bit of a flaw here, or not necessarily a flaw, but a place where you can be like, oh, I could see how if that piece went wrong, like, there's an obvious place where autoimmunity could happen. And in fact, we're going to review part of that B cell uh, information a, a little bit later today. And I um, introduced you to the Goldilocks model of thymic selection um, last time. So what I uh, told you is that our developing T cells or thymocytes are going to interact with MHC and peptide that it presents um, in the thymus. Um, there will be MHC class 1 and MHC class 2 um, getting uh, expressed and presented in the thymus. Um, and the only peptides that will be there, this will become a bigger deal as we go forward, are, uh, in fact, some self-peptides. And the, T the developing T cell or thymocyte is kind of going to be adding up how much signal it gets while it's in the thymus. And there are four outcomes for what could happen to that uh, T cell based on how much signal that T cell gets in the thymus. So one option is that the T cell can get no or sort of low signal. Um, different figures will, e will list this as either no or low. So I'm, we're going to kind of put it as either of those. We can have some T cells that are going to get kind of low intermediate. So it's like medium, but on the low side of medium. 
We've got some cells that are going to get high intermediate, so medium but on the high side. Or the cell can get a high signal. If the cell, um, and on the, in the image on the left here, you only actually see three outcomes because the other outcome they're trying, they think is no affinity and they just don't show you what happens if there's no affinity because if there's no affinity, how do you show it? Um, so um, that's one place already where sort of that lowest one being no low um, comes into play. So if the cell gets no signal or very little signal, then that cell is in, in its whole time in the thymus, then that cell is clearly not even able to respond to the MHC. Because it's like the whole time that it's hanging out there, it's going through this part of the thymus. It gets no signal. It gets no pats on the head. It doesn't recognize MHC. It's useless. Um, and that cell gets no signal to survive. And so that cell is going to undergo um, death by neglect. We also say that that cell fails positive selection. Because it didn't get any pat on the head to keep going. Um, there's another way that sometimes people talk about this where we will say um, neglect the useless. If these cells get a little bit of a signal in the thymus, then they're probably binding to some MHC, but they're maybe not binding super strongly to any of the peptides. Maybe they would bind super strongly to a slightly different peptide that isn't present in the thymus, that is maybe present on a pathogen later on. So it's good that they can bind to MHC, but not really binding to any peptide, not enough to get any signal. So they're getting this sort of low level signal, kind of medium low signal. Um, that signal is enough to get a pat on the head and to be told, you should live. And in fact, that cell will eventually finish developing in the thymus and leave the thymus as a T cell. And so we talk about that cell as being positively selected. Um, sometimes we say that we will um, select the useful. Um, and so this cell gets to become a T cell. Yay. You can also see in this image that the majority of cells, because they're just randomly putting together V's, D's, and J's of their heavy chain and V's and J's of their light chain, the majority of them are going to make some receptor that is useless, and the majority of them will die by neglect. Um, and it's a relatively small number of those developing T cells that will actually survive and make it out of the thymus. Some cells in the thymus, however, are going to bind, get a lot of signal. Either they're going to bind to everything kind of strongly, or they're going to bind to some peptide, some peptide that's being presented, some self-peptide, really strongly. Um, that's pretty dangerous, because if they can bind to a self-peptide presented on MHC pretty strongly, that means if you let them out into the periphery, they are going to bind to that same thing pretty strongly and make a T-cell response, potentially leading to some kind of autoimmune disease. So those are pretty harmful. Those are bad. And so we're going to actively kill those. The cells that get um, that undergo death by neglect, it's sort of like a passive thing. They just never get a signal to live. We don't actively try to kill them. Here, we're actively going to kill the cell. We're actively going to say, yeah, no, you're not allowed to leave. Um, and so if we have this high signal, um, we're going to negatively select this cell. 
um, because that cell is, and so we're going to act, tell that cell to undergo apoptosis. Um, sometimes we say kill the harmful. Um, because that cell could potentially lead to autoimmunity if it comes out of the thymus. And so that cell is going to undergo apoptosis in the thymus. And you can see that's another um, decent percentage of those cells. Um, and you can see why that book I mentioned to you called thymus, the thymus kind of murder university here. Um, I'm not going to say a ton about a ton more about this um, here. I will just mention there is this fourth potential outcome. What you can notice with this fourth potential outcome is that those cells are still getting a medium amount of signal, but it's it's high. These cells are kind of dangerous-ish. They're not as crazy dangerous as the cells that um, go, that have high affinity, but they're, they're a little bit, eh. You maybe don't totally want them being a normal T cell in the periphery either. Um, the thing that ends up happening to them is that they become a specialized kind of T cell with a different function than other T cells. Um, because it's easier for me to discuss those cells when we're talking about T cell function next week, I'm going to go more into this option next week when I talk about the function of those specialized T cells. So this will come back next week. But just realize now it's kind of these cells that are borderline dangerous. Um, and we're going to push them to a different function. Um, and so we often talk about this. It's known as the Goldilocks model, where in order for a T cell to survive the thymus, it can't get too little signal. It can't get too much signal. It has to get just right signal, just like Goldilocks. Um, and you can see this um, in these figures from your textbook. So here is sort of positive selection. We have MHC being presented by our cell of the thymus, which is the cell shown here in orange. Um, if we have absolutely no binding, then that cell dies by neglect. If we have some binding, then that's enough to tell the cell to live. Um, we also, you can see negative selection here, where if we have super tight binding, that's going to induce apoptosis, whereas if we have kind of medium binding, that's just enough to tell the cell uh, to go ahead and live. Um, and this is the reason for um, this uh, observation that I told you before, that T cells are always restricted by the MHC of the thymus. In order to be positively selected, in order to get some signal, the T cell has to be able to get some signal from those structure cells of the thymus. It has to be able to respond to um, the uh, MHC plus peptide that's being presented by the structure cells of the thymus. The only way that T cell can get a signal is by interacting with the structure cell of the thymus. And so that's how the T cell learns what self is. Um, so the T basically it gets a signal from the structure cells of the thymus that says, yes, you respond to self. And so I mentioned before that we can do all sorts of crazy experiments where, you know, the developing T cell could have different genetics. And depending on what kind of thymus we put it into, it will learn different types of MHC as self. Um, it's all because of positive selection. Um, the fact that it has to be able to survive positive selection and interact with that cell of the thymus. Um, and most of these steps of positive and negative selection, um, you can think of as happening in the medulla. You can see that, yes, some of it does start to happen in the cortex, but the majority of this is really going on in the medulla. Um, that's, of course, also where we're going to see um, Fewer cells, if you remember, that was a part that was less dense. And a lot of that's because many of the cells are dying there. So it's not going to be as densely populated as the cortex where all the cells had been dividing um, and getting us to a very um, dense population. Um, 
I just thought of another thing I was going to say, and I already forgot it. Hopefully, I'll remember. So there are, um, there's one, a couple other things we need to think about if we actually think about the Goldilocks model. Um, so there is kind of a big positive that we need to think about with the Goldilocks model, and we can also think about a negative. Um, I'm going to spend some time kind of thinking about a positive first, and then I'm going to come back here and we're going to talk about the negative more as sort of a theoretical thing. If you think back to when we talked about B cell development and B cell selection, we also saw central tolerance mechanisms um, for B cells. One of them was deletion, which is pretty similar to what we saw for T cells. There were two other ones, receptor editing and energy. No, we have not, there's no receptor editing, there's no energy here. So that's already a place where stuff is different. Um, but there's also, there was also something else that we talked about that was sort of a, an issue or an asterisk that we thought about with B cell development and B cell selection and how central tolerance worked in B cells. It was sort of a situation where you could be like, oh, I could see how a B cell could fall through the cracks here and give me an autoimmune disease um, in thinking about that piece of it. And I'm at the moment, who knows why I'm like second guessing myself and I'm like, but did you like emphasize it enough? Maybe they don't know. Um, so if you don't know, it's fine. I will just tell myself, yeah, it's true. You didn't emphasize it enough. Um, so what do you think, what can you think of as a way that um, from what we talked about with B cell development, something could go wrong and allow a self-reactive B cell to make it through um, B cell development. My brain is screaming that I didn't tell you, that I didn't emphasize it enough. So if you don't know, that's okay. <laughs> um, so one of the things that go, that's really important with B cells and B cell development is that B cells are only tested against antigens that are found in the bone marrow. So if there is a protein that is like only transcribed and translated or expressed in your eye, the B cell is never getting tested against that. It's only getting tested against proteins that are found in the bone marrow. Any tissue specific protein that's in some not the bone marrow tissue, B cells don't get tested against. So why is that a potential problem? Yeah, Josh. It's kind of different that they're only tested where um, they're only tested against things in the bone marrow. They're not mm -hmm. tested against anything else in the body. Yes. Yeah, so, so in the bone marrow, there are probably some pretty common things like you know collagen and actin and a lot of the common things that are in your whole body. But there are definitely proteins that are not in the bone marrow, and the B cells do not get tested against those and get to leave the bone marrow, reacting against those. And so you might hear that and be like, "Oh no, now I'm scared." Not only did we let those anergic B cells out, which were already slightly sketch. We also let out any B cell that responded to something else in the body that isn't in the bone marrow. That seems like a problem, right? If you notice, when we talked about tolerance at this point, I've talked about central tolerance. And central tolerance is a tolerance process or a way that we deal with self-reactive cells during development in a primary lymphoid organ. Later on, when we are in the periphery, we have another set of tolerance mechanisms called the peripheral tolerance mechanisms. And fortunately, the peripheral tolerance mechanisms deal with those B cells. And so here we're really thinking about the central tolerance mechanisms. Um, so the first thing I want to mention um, has to do with um, sort of how this same issue of tissue specific antigens is handled in the thymus. And so that's why I wanted to make it really clear that about the um, tissue specific antigens because that's one place where we see something really unique with 
the thymus, and that's very different between T cell development and B cell development. One thing that I've already told you is that some of the cell cells of the thymus, particularly thymic epithelial cells, are unique cells in that they can present on MHC class 2 even though they aren't one of the professional antigen presenting cells. So um, cells of the thymus are unique in that they present on MHC class 2, and that's specifically so that developing T cells can test themselves against MHC class 2 plus peptide. So that's a pretty good system that we kind of have an exception for epithelial cells in the thymus. Particularly, they are... Um, the epithelial cells in the medulla of the thymus um, that are actually presenting on class 2. So that's pretty good. But the cell, some cells in the thymus are also unique for another way. Um, and so you, uh, you can see the these little star-shaped cells are these cells of the thymus, specific thymus, Thymic, specifically, I don't know why I can't talk to them, thymic medullary uh, cells or thymic medullary epithelial cells, parts of the thymus medulla. They are also unique because what we have found is that they transcribe and translate, so they express every protein in the genome, even the ones that are only supposed to be made in the eye, like see the red one is made in the retina. It's made in the retina and in the medulla of the thymus. This blue protein is made in the ovaries only, and also the medulla of the thymus. And so the, those medullary epithelial cells of the thymus are unique because they actually make every protein of the body. Um, this is happening, um, and so that allows the thymus to do negative selection on every single antigen instead of just the thymus ones, because we just make the thymus make everything. Um, this, is, this is happening under the control of a protein called AIR, um, which stands for the autoimmune regulator. Um, AIR is a little bit funny. Because um, if you look at experiments regarding air, everything tells you that air is a transcription factor that should turn on all the genes in the body, right? Except that no one can make it be a transcription factor in certain types of experiments. So, like, everything says it should be a transcription factor except, like, official transcription factor experiments. So exactly what it's doing is a little bit wonky still. Um, but the idea is that it is telling the thymus, whether it's directly as a transcription factor or indirectly through other things, it's telling the medullary epithelial cells of the thymus, transcribe every gene, translate all the proteins so that we can test T cells against everything. Um, this is actually some data from um, the paper where AIR was described. And so what these authors were doing is they were actually looking in the thymus to see um, what genes um, seemed to be controlled by AIR. Um, specifically, they were looking at um, some individuals who um, did not have AIR, and they looked to see what uh, genes were not being transcribed, what proteins were missing in their thymus. Um, all of the ones that are here in red are uh, genes that are, should usually only be made in one lo uh, location, one tissue of the body that's not the thymus. So you can see like um, some good examples are salivary protein 1 is usually only made in the salivary gland, but it looks like air tells the thymus to make it. Uh, major urinary protein 1 should only be made in the liver, but air also tells the thymus to make it. Oxytocin should only be made in the brain, but air tells the thymus to make it. Um, and you can see, uh, you know, pre-pro neuropeptide, pre-pro insulin. Um, there are a few that are in maybe a few tissues or that aren't 
quite as broadly um, defined, but you can see that um, all of these genes are um, going to be influenced by air. And so air is really important in allowing the thymus to make all of these different breadth of genes. Yeah, Grace. Is there not, like, this is not really discussing all of them, like, the... So that's a great question. Um, I haven't seen any specific data on thymic medullary epithelial cells and RAG. Um, my first, my, my guess, just based on, you know, knowledge right now, is that maybe these cells aren't super proliferative. And so it wouldn't be a huge issue if RAG was on. Um, but I actually have not, I have not looked at specific details uh, of data on RAG and um, AIR. Um, so um, the way that AIR was actually described in this paper was in finding a group of patients who had a really kind of weird disease. Um, and when they were examined, it, eventually what they found is that they were missing AIR. And so that's what led to this disease. Um, these patients have a disease called Aposed. I'm going to tell you what Aposed stands for. I do not care if you know, because some of the things, like, we don't totally even know, still, like, know exactly how they're related. Um, but it, it does stand for autoimmune, that one's kind of important, polyendocrinopathy, candidiasis, and ectodermal dystrophy. So what happens in these patients is that these patients have autoimmune diseases against many organs. It's like they have multiple autoimmune diseases at once. So for example, if you look at a group of APOSED patients, 85% of them have hypoparathyroidism, and 72% of them, 72% have adrenal failure. So you can imagine a whole bunch of both of those things. 60% um, of the women have ovarian failure. 18% have um, insulin-dependent diabetes. 14% um, of the men have testicular atrophy, and on and on. And so these patients, because they can't de properly do negative selection in the thymus, because they are not exposing T cells to these antigens during development to delete them, are letting all sorts of autoreactive T cells out into the rest of the body and making some kind of, um, and making sort of multiple autoimmune diseases. Each patient will have slightly different symptoms based on which T cells fell through the cracks in them. So no patient's gonna have exactly the same symptoms. Um, and you can see this might be sort of a challenge to diagnose and figure out. Um, all of the patients have candidiasis, which is a yeast infection, a free recurring yeast infection, particularly of the mouth. Um, not completely clear what the deal is with that. Um, a bunch of, most of them have nail dystrophy, so their, their fingernails look funny, as you can see here. There are a few other things that a lot of them have. Um, and exactly how those things relate to T-cell development, we're really not totally sure. Um, but this is kind of how we discovered air and the fact that all of these proteins are made in the thymus. It seems, air also seems particularly important for some different proteins. Um, it really seems to be a big deal for um, T-cells that respond to like the endocrine system. <laughs> like, so it's often endocrine related autoimmune diseases. Um, in people have made mice that are missing the air gene, and those mice actually seem relative, like healthier than you would expect, except for their salivary glands, which are just like destroyed by autoimmunity. So it exactly some of these details, just like I mentioned, exactly the is it a transcription factor or what is it doing, are still not completely worked out. Um, but the idea is that air is allowing um, the thymus to. Uh, make all of these tissue-specific proteins. Um, and this is really happening in the medullary thymic epithelial cells. So we're in the medulla. It's the thymic epithelial cells. And that's uh, presenting all sorts of tissue-specific cells or tissue-specific proteins to allow for this negative selection. Um, and here you can see this kind of in the medulla and sort of at the border um, as well. 
Um, we're still in the double positive self. Um, and so once a cell has kind of made it through negative and positive selection, that cell finally gets to become a mature T cell that's ready to leave the thymus. That cell will first have been making both CD4 and CD8, and you can see that there's a ton of those cells in the thymus. Part of that is because we had proliferation steps. Um, and then those cells will eventually choose to either be a CD4 or a CD8 cell. So they will turn one of these co-receptors off, leave the other one on, become a single positive cell, and then that cell will end up leaving the thymus. And you can also see that there are way fewer single positives than there are double positives. And at least part of that is because so many of the double positives die um, with negative and positive selection. Once that cell um, has made it through the negative and positive selection and has um, sort of become a, a single positive cell, now we call that cell a mature T cell. And really that cell is basically just on its way out uh, of the thymus. And now when that cell gets into the periphery, it's going to do T cell stuff if it gets signaled through its T cell receptor. Um, so here you can see kind of the whole uh, finish of T cell selection. Um, so our cell was a double positive. It hopefully got some positive selection, did not get negative selection, and was able to become a mature T cell. Now instead of having CD4 and CD8, it has a CD4 or CD8 and is a single positive cell and is ready to head out of the thymus. Um, and one thing that is, has been debated quite a bit in the field is um, has to do with how exactly the cell knows um, if how to become a CD4 or a CD8. Like, how does it know it recognizes class 1 or class 2? and sort of exactly what the differences are there. This has been argued about for a lot of years. There was a paper that came out um, pretty recently we talked about on um, our podcast that honestly, like, blew my mind a bit. Um, that actually, I think, addressed that, like, finally kind of gave us an answer. And it had to do with how long the cell gets signals in the thymus. Um, so we now think the cell actually does kind of learn, am I responding to CD4 or CD8? Um, Am I responding to class one or class two? You know, is CD4 or CD8 better <laughs> um, because of what I'm responding to? It, we think it does actually get a signal. Um, the length of that signal is important, and that tells it which direction it should be going. Um, but that is something that is um, your your textbook, for example, sort of like hand waves at it because that's something that's been a, an issue in the field. But I'm realizing that I didn't tell you the other the issue with T cell development. Or with with um, the Goldilocks model, I didn't tell you kind of. Yeah, this is the slide I want. I didn't tell you kind of what the flaw in this plan was. The flaw in this plan is a pretty big deal, so I kind of need to tell you. Um. So again, we saw with B cells, the flaw in the plan was that. Um, we let B cells that don't respond or that we don't test B cells against tissue specific antigens. We let the tissue specific ones out of the bone marrow because we don't have those antigens in the bone marrow to test them. And we say, whew, I'm glad peripheral tolerance exists to be another le level of protection against those scary B cells. There are also some reasons why some T cells are scary. And what I hope you get from this, at least in part, is why peripheral tolerance is a really good thing and a really big deal for T cells. Because when, when we realize that this problem is, you're going to be like, oh, crap. Um, and I don't know if some of you have noticed, uh, I have messed up my ankle a few times. I have an ankle brace. 
and I actually, the reason why I remembered this is because part of when I um, do the demo is I stand on one foot and like talk about my ankle. And so I'm like, oh, right, my ankle brace. I have to talk about the ankle part. Um, so um, if you look at this, can you imagine what the problem is here? Remember, every T cell that is developing, every T cell that makes it out of the thymus and becomes a thymocyte, so every T cell that succeeds, that gets positively selected, has to bind, get a signal in the thymus, right? What is this signal that this, that cell is getting in the thymus? So it's binding MHC plus peptide, right? That's that's what the signal is. And it's binding what kind of peptide? Self-peptide. Every T cell in your body can weakly bind self-peptide. It has to be able to weakly bind self-peptide to get out of the thymus. If it doesn't bind self-peptide at all, it gets uh it is uh neglected. Which means every T cell in your body that actually like goes into the periphery is weakly self-reactive. Every single T cell you have is weakly self-reactive. So you are, I'm gonna do it on not my bad ankle. As your T cells are coming out of the thymus, you're basically balancing on the edge of autoimmune disease. All those T cells are weakly self-reactive. And if something, so if, if they maybe get a little too strong of a signal in the periphery, you're an autoimmune disease. So your immune system has evolved this way to put you right on the absolute knife edge of autoimmunity with the thymus. We can think a little bit about why that sort of evolutionarily makes sense. Um, if you think about it, infectious disease is a pretty big threat. You really want to have the broadest set of T cells coming out of the thymus as possible, right? You You really want a very broad set of T-cells, T-cells that are MHC restricted. You want to let, get as many of those possibly useful ones out as possible because you want to protect your, you as a kid and have you like live through childhood protected from infectious diseases. Most major autoimmune diseases start to strike people in their 30s and after. And so the idea is, well, if peripheral tolerance is going to fail, you've got some time to survive and reproduce before that. And it's hard to select against something that happens that late in life because it's happening after you've survived and reproduced. There isn't really a lot of selective pressure against things that are happening that late in life. And so we have basically selected to have the broadest possible immune response, even though we are right on the edge of autoimmune disease. And what you can realize is we say, oh, my gosh, thank goodness that we have a lot of peripheral tolerance mechanisms <laughs> to keep those T cells in line. And you can imagine now, if something goes wrong with those peripheral tolerance mechanisms, um, bad things happen. Um, so once our T cell has gone through this process, that T cell gets to leave the thymus and is now going to go to the periphery. Um, this is a very important place in the course, because this is kind of where we're going to be transitioning a little bit um, into thinking about what, how we actually deal with pathogens and deal with things in the periphery. So we are actually changing into the immune response in space and time section of the course. Basically, we've been just developing. We've developed ourselves. We're now going to have them do something. We are now in the periphery. Um, and we're going to be following what happens with our T cells in the periphery for the next uh, few uh, lectures. Um, really, we're kind of thinking about adaptive immune responses in the periphery. We will come back to B cells um, in a bit. We'll, we'll have to see how when I change around my schedule where I put those B cells, but they're coming. Um, so you can notice here that um, this figure shows those T cells. Um, in the periphery, 
One thing to note about uh, the, the T cells in the periphery um, is shown here. So this is a plot of CD4 um, versus CD8 uh, in the periphery. Um, and in, the, in both of these situations, we're looking at a secondary lymphoid organ, either a lymph node or a spleen. Um, as far as I'm concerned, lymph node and spleen, for a lot of our purposes, are indistinguishable. They're just there. You can flip them back and forth. Um, and they are the periphery in a lot of cases. Usually the lymph node or spleen and blood are the things that are the periphery. And here we're just looking at kind of all the um, leukocytes in either the lymph node or the spleen. This is real data. I'm going to there's it's good and it's bad. So I just want to point out a couple things about this. I want you to remember with the thymus, I looked at the leukocytes in the thymus, I would get a plot that looks something like this, right? Um, really, all the leukocytes in the thymus are developing T cells. And so I can see these different populations. If I look in spleen or lymph node, I'll pick lymph node today, but it could really be either one. I would see something that looks different. One thing that I would see is I would see a good number of cells that are CD4 positive, CD8 negative, or CD8 negative, CD8 positive, CD4 negative. Basically the single positive cells. These are just these guys that came out of the thymus. And there's a bunch of them. I might, if I'm looking at leukocytes in the lymph nodes or spleen, also see a bunch of cells that are negative for both. Those would be the not T cells. Those would be the B cells and the NK cells and all the other things that might be in the secondary lymphoid organs. I would not see any double positives. You can see in the real data they have a teensy bit. The answer is no. <laughs> there are no double positives. Double positive T cells are only found in the thymus during T cell development. In this plot that I show you of the lymph of the lymph node, I'm looking at all leukocytes. If I was looking at all lymphocytes, it'd basically be the same thing because these could still be B cells and NK cells. Okay. Sometimes here I was looking at all leukocytes, but I kind of don't really care because the only leukocytes that are there are developing T cells. I can also set up my experiment slightly differently. And so I can take my cells in the lymph node and I can gate them so that I'm only looking at the T cells and I don't see the other cell types. So I could take this and I could gate on CD3. That means I would be looking at only the cells with CD3 which is only the T cells. And if I look at only the T cells in my lymph node, I will only see those CD4s and CD8s and won't see this uh, negative population. Um, so that's what it, the data would look like in real life. This is how we might draw it and how I might depict it for you um, elsewhere. Um, and so this is what we see in the thymus versus the periphery. Um, with the periphery, we can also gate on CD3. If I gated on CD3 in the thymus and only looked at T cells, it would look exactly the same because I only ever had T cells. <laughs> so it wouldn't matter if I gated on CD3 because there were only T cells there in the first place, so I had nobody to eliminate. Here I was eliminating the not T cells or the not CD3 positive cells. Um, and so that's what we see with those T cells in the periphery. Um, and like I said, now we're in the periphery. And we're actually going to see some of our cells responding. We finally have pathogens. Yay.
Um, so now we're going to look at the periphery. You can see that typically when we're looking at the periphery, we are thinking about the secondary lymphoid organs here. Um, and you can see this in this figure as well as the figures I'll show you on the next slide as well. So when our B cells leave the bone marrow, which is really the last time we saw our B cells, or when our CD4s and CD8s leave the thymus, they go into the blood, but then they tend to um, distribute largely to secondary lymphoid organs or potentially to barrier tissues. They can also kind of come back into the blood flow or they can just hang out moving around the secondary lymphoid organs. And so this is showing you, this says 10% go to the barrier organs, 40% go to lymph node. What is that? I don't even know what they're trying to say. If 40 go to the lymph node and 50 to the spleen, I don't even know. It doesn't matter. Honestly, those numbers are all sketchy anyway, because you can find dramatically different percentages for what that barrier organ number is. Like, if you, you will watch, see, you can go watch TV and you will hear something about like, this percent, like 90% of your immune system is in your gut for certain like probiotics, gut health, um, products. Because people actually argue about what percent of T cells live in your gut, which is a barrier organ. And honestly, the reason why you can argue about that is because to actually do this, to figure out exactly all these numbers, you would have to take all the T cells out of the whole body and know exactly where they came from and count. And that would mean like taking out someone's entire intestine, cutting it up so that the T cells can escape out of the walls, digesting it well. And so we don't have great counts for those. And the way you do the experiment does make those numbers vary quite a bit. Um, but what you can see in these figures, so this, the one on the right is the same that you've seen before, is that those cells um, will leave the primary lymphoid organ, head to the blood, but then start to go into some of these other secondary lymphoid organs. And we're mostly going to be seeing them in secondary lymphoid organs. Um, if the cell just stays in the blood and doesn't go into any secondary lymphoid organs, it will make a, a round, a circuit of the body in 30 minutes. Um, but you can see that it might leave and spend some number of hours in a secondary lymphoid organ. And you can see once it's in the secondary lymphoid organ, it might then just go through the lymphatic system and travel through lymphatic vessels and just stay away from the blood, only dumping back into the blood later on. In thinking about um, immune responses, you know, now we're really kind of be kind of thinking about our adaptive immune response. Um, the figure in the upper left is the figure that I we usually use for this and that I'm going to spend some time talking about for this. The reason why I have the figure that's in the upper right is because people always want a version of, of this one with like actual numbers on it. So I gave you a piece of real data so you could have actual numbers. In reality, the num there are lots of things that make the actual numbers vary. That's why we don't usually show it with actual numbers, but people want numbers, so there's my numbers um, for this. And what you can notice in either of them is that we have the situation where the microbe enters the body. We have the microbe come into the body, listed here as first infection. And here we can see kind of our measurable adaptive immune responses our measurable antibody response, our measurable T cell response. And what you notice is that they seem to really peak about a week after infection. Exactly, like I said, exactly how many days um, will vary in a bunch of different situations. In my experiment that I show you, you just can look at the black lines. Um, I had a super low, I could actually detect that like one cell that came out of the thymus before the infection um, at the beginning. So we had super low numbers. You know, they started to um, actually increase by day seven. And really, I got to a peak at about day 14. So and you can see, or maybe day 10, day 14, we were really getting those huge numbers. 
And so that's when I could, especially if I'm not using super sensitive data to detect, um, you know, I'm not going to find my response for like a week. I'm not going to feel better. Um, if you think about, you know, people talking about how long it takes for your vaccine to kick in, um, there, we're usually talking about this kind of time period, right? And this issue and this sort of piece of the timing is something that we're going to be coming back to a bunch probably over the next week of this class. Because in every case, we can think about the same question being part of this. of What the heck takes so long? What are these T-cells doing? Are they on vacation during all this time? Like, what, what, what took them a week? Why was it that I infected these mice with a virus this day? Why was it that I didn't get a good T-cell response until way over here? Um, and the answer is that there are a bunch of different events that have to happen in order to make a good adaptive response. And so for each of the next few days, we're going to be thinking about some of those different events. This figure um, from your textbook kind of breaks this down in terms of the events. So we have uh, infection at the very beginning, but we don't have getting rid of the pathogen until these yellow boxes at the end. There's a time gap in between, and there are a bunch of different events that have to happen. And so, in fact, all, pretty much the next week or so are going to be thinking about some of these different events. The first event we really need to think about is that we somehow have to get the antigen to a secondary lymphoid organ. I've already kind of highlighted to you, and we'll see much more of this, that we tend to have our lymphocytes, particularly our T cells, start a reaction and find microbes in a secondary lymphoid organ. I've told you that's where we start, how responses, where responses are initiated. Also, people like to talk about it, that that's where the party happens. So we got to somehow get the antigen there. If it was infecting my skin, we somehow got to get it from my skin to my lymph node. We also have to get the T cell to the lymph node. So before we can have any events where the T cell and the antigen meet and do things, we got to move them both to the right location. Um, and so you can see we've got to get the T cells in the tissue. We've got to get the, t the antigen in the tissue. Then we're going to have to have some other additional events happening. But for the rest of the time today um, and for some of Monday, we're going to be talking about how we get the T cells and the antigen to the secondary lymphoid organ to make this process happen. Um, and this image kind of also just gives people, because a lot of times people want numbers on this sort of stuff, and it's we, we don't have great numbers for a bunch of reasons, but people want numbers. So you can see that it might take up to 24 hours for the antigen to get into the lymphoid organ. Sort of, um, it can be minutes to up to 24 hours. Um, and we might not even have the T cell interacting with the antigen for in the B cell case, a few hours for the T cell case. It might be like a day. Um, so this early part of how the heck do we get the antigen here? See, here's an antigen coming across the skin barrier, how we get the antigen from coming into the body all the way to the lymph node or that secondary lymphoid organ is kind of our first problem. It is really the first thing that's taken so long is making all this happen. The antigen part is pretty easy. Although I'm looking at this slide and I'm mad at myself for putting some things in this order, but it's okay, we're gonna roll with it. Um, the antigen side, like I said, how we get the antigen there is actually relatively straightforward. Um, so here is someone stepping on a rusty nail that is potentially allowing some microbe into the body. Um, that microbe or that antigen might be these red dots. We've talked about the lymphatic system previously. And so we have those open vessels that are collecting interstitial fluid, that are collecting liquid, and those antigens can just be collected up too. 
So those antigens might just get picked up along with the liquid and moved along the lymph node, moved along the lymphatic vessels until they get to the lymph node. And so it's sort of a pretty passive process where that antigen may just get transited to the lymph node. You can also see this um, here on the left. You can see just random bacteria and um, bacterial components getting taken up by the lymphatic vessels and eventually making their way to the secondary lymphoid organ like a lymph node. Um, and this kind of gets to this idea of, you know, we have these draining lymph nodes. So you've got a lymph node for each different part of your body that is draining that part of their bo your body and that is receiving the antigens. We can also we also have some cells that are in a number of body locations um, that are called dendritic cells that can actually pick up the antigen and carry it to the lymph node. And as I'm looking at my slides right now, I would I'm thinking I want to talk more about dendritic cells right here and I don't have my dendritic cell slides. So we're just going to say dendritic cells can carry that antigen to the lymph node. And in the future, I will tell you more about dendritic cells and their carrying antigen to the lymph node because I don't have those slides right now. And we can see kind of what we the, the lymph node structure here. So antigens or um, those dendritic cells with antigen will come in through some lymphatic vessel into the lymph node. And you can see that there are some different types of structures in the lymph nodes. So there are different areas, some of which can, are often referred to as the B cell zone, some of which are referred to as the T cell zone. You might guess who lives in each of those zones. Um, we also have an artery coming in and a vein coming out. So we have the uh, blood flow in and out should say, cells be wanting to come in or out of the lymph node. Um, and we also have a, a lymphatic vessel that is going out if, say, the cell wants to stay in secondary lymphoid world. Um, so getting the antigen to the lymph node is kind of relatively straightforward and is maybe not something we're going to talk a ton about right now. But getting how the heck we get the lymphocyte to the lymph node is a bigger problem. Um, the lymphocyte has two choices based on this lymph node structure of how it could go to the lymph node. One way that that cell could go into the lymph node is through blood vessels, through the bloodstream. Remember that we saw there was an artery coming in to that lymph node. And so the cell could come from the blood into the lymph node. So remember I said it comes out of the thymus, hits the blood, and it can go in the blood or secondary lymphoid organs. So it could go, hey, I'm in the blood. Oh, I, I decided I want to be in this lymph node. Alternatively, it can come through one of those lymphatic vessels um, and um, move through lymphatic vessels. So it's got a couple different choices of how that process happens. Um, and the T cell will use a specific process to, to get into the, um, lymph node. And this, and particularly the process that we're really talking about here is the process for which, from which a T cell is going to be coming with the, from the blood. So largely what we're going to be talking about for the rest of this time and whatever amount of Monday I have to do, um, is going to be how the cell comes from the blood. It turns out that immune cells have to go places from the blood pretty often. Blood's a pretty nice sort of highway for immune cells, but there are lots of situations why immune cells might need to leave the blood and go to some other place. They might be a T cell that just came out of the thymus that wants to go into the lymph node. It also is possible that it might be a neutrophil that we saw earlier in the semester that wants to leave a blood vessel and go to a site of inflammation. 
It also might be a T cell that's become activated, say, against SARS-CoV-2 and wants to go to the lung and kill SARS-CoV-2. In all of those cases, the T cell is going to, the, the cell, whether it's the neutrophil or the T cell, is going to travel through the blood and then have to leave the blood vessel and go to a place. I mentioned that there's a set of steps that happen for going to the lymph node. It's actually the same set of steps any time the cell has to leave the blood. And so I'm going to talk about these steps here because they apply to the leaving the to going into the lymph node part. But in fact, I could have talked about them when we did innate immunity for what the neutrophil does, because the neutrophil is basically doing the same thing. Um, your textbook actually covers this stuff in multiple places. So it's the same three step process. And we need to think a little bit about that three step process. I'm um, I went back and forth on the next two slides about whether I wanted them in or not. So I'm going to tell you about them like super fast. Um, and uh, they actually just mention a technique that is part of the way that we that some of this gets studied. And the reason why I, I left them in is because I'm going to show you some data that comes from this technique. And so I want you to have a clue what I'm talking about or where it's going on. And so we actually have the ability to watch cells move through lymph nodes and through the blood in mice in real time uh, through something called intravital microscopy. And so um, what we can actually do is uh, surgically make it so that we can see a particular lymph node um, and anesthetize a mouse and sort of hold that lymph node and then use microscopy to actually watch the cells move through the lymph node and through vessels. And so I'm going to show you cells actually moving through vessels in some of the next um, things. The mouse is anesthetized. Um, so you can see it's got a heat circulator. It's got anesthesia coming in. It's immobilized. Um, I'm going to mention that because in one of the images, they actually like um, change what's going on with the anesthesia of the mouse. And you can see the cells changing. Um, so um, you're going to when I show you cells moving. Yeah, these are actual cells moving through vessels in real time in a mouse um, through intravital microscopy. And understanding why we need this process goes back a little bit to thinking about blood flow. We've already thought a little bit about um, the issues of pressure that come from generally understanding the circulatory system. Um, but we can, one can also take some of these numbers that are shown here in terms of diameter of the vessel and things like that. And we can do calculations to see how fast the cells are moving. And if I told you how fast they were moving, you'd be like, eh, this doesn't sound that fancy. Because I give it to you in like meters per second. But if you think about a cell, a cell is not one meter big. A cell might be like 10 microns big, 0 0.01 meters. And so if you thought about how many times the cell is moving its like whole body size per second, then it's like, oh, that's a lot. Like if we thought about how many body lengths I moved per second and you were telling wanted me to move many, many, many lengths of my body per second, that would that would be scary. Right. Um, these cells are actually going through the same amount of force in this situation as you would in kind of the most hardcore um, white water rafting. Um, these cells are going through massive, massive force. And we can see that in this image. So you're going to be able to see, especially like right here, um, a bunch of cells moving through the vessel. OK. And the goal that I want you to think about here is I want you to think about what this is sort of like as a cell, what kind of pressures and stresses the cell has undergoing. And we're even going to have eventually an analogy we're going to spend a lot of time talking about. And hopefully this will help us think about that analogy, too. So there you can see those cells actually moving through different types of vessels. And you should realize how incredibly fast that is for the cell. And if the cell, the, the cell is not going to just be like, oh, I'm going to stop now. 
and move and go to this place, right? Like, what would ha- what does this remind you of? Yes, yeah, see, the mouse is breathing, so it, things move a little bit. Um, what does this remind you of? Like, for an analogy? Yeah. A stream, okay. Yeah. A highway. Like, imagine some big, super busy, like, five-lane giant highway, right? The highway is definitely the, the stream. Um, a little too calm. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, totally. New York traffic, okay? So let's imagine that you're in New York traffic. You're in, like, five lanes, rush hour, but actually people moving, not <laughs> stopped, <laughs> um, 95 by New York City, right? And you're like, oh, look, there's my exit. I want to leave. I will hit my brakes, and I will go into my exit, and I will leave. How is that going to work out? You're going to crash, right? There's going to be a lot of crashing and a lot of destruction and a lot of bad news, right? So you actually have to go through a series of steps, and you have to go through a process if you want to get out of that traffic and get to your exit. The steps that we're going to see these cells doing are basically akin to the same steps that you're going to do on that highway situation. And so I often find that students find thinking about the highway in this situation, this highway analogy, as being really um, helpful in terms of thinking about the steps. Um, and so on Monday, I will start with going through some of those steps, and we'll talk about exactly what steps that cell has to do so that we don't have a big crash and so that your blood, like, keeps flowing you know, all those things that would make you kind of healthy. Um, so I'll see you guys on Monday. Remember your problem set by five.